Greetings and welcome to the Geese College of Business, Coronavirus and its Business Implications faculty panel. I'm Amanda Brantner, Senior Associate Director of Learner Relations for online programs here at the University of Illinois Geese College of Business. And I look forward to spending the next hour with each of you. This is a special mock live class session. You may have noticed that your mock microphone is off by default. This is to ensure a smooth presentation with minimal audio disruptions. If you wish, wish to speak with our faculty during the presentation or have a question you'd like to ask, please feel free to indicate this using the raise hand feature in Zoom. At appropriate moments during the presentation, I will call on those of you who have their hands raised to speak, at which point you'll be temporarily unmuted and be able to bring your question to the classroom. In the meantime, we invite you to turn your videos on during today's session so that we can see you and enable deeper personal engagement with each of you. During today's session, we will start with each of our faculty sharing a review and update that layers on to the webinars they've delivered over the last six weeks. During these chats, these uh, updates, you can share your questions in the chat. Following the faculty members opening remarks, we look forward to bringing your questions into the digital classroom. At this time, it is my pleasure to brief, briefly introduce the three distinguished faculty on our panel today, each joining us remotely from their homes. Professor Larry DeBrock is Professor of Finance and Dean Emeritus of East College of Business. Professor DeBrock earned his PhD in economics from Cornell in 1980 and has been on the faculty at Illinois for more than 40 years. Professor DeBrock's students note his gift for making complex economic concepts both compelling and understandable. Professor Carlos Torelli is Professor of Marketing and Executive Director of Professional and Executive Education. Professor Torelli earned his PhD in marketing right here at Illinois and was on the faculty at the Carlson School of Management prior to returning to his alma mater. Before becoming an academic, Professor Torelli was, on, was the marketing vice president of Citibank in Venezuela and Turkey. Finally, Professor Elizabeth Luckman is a clinical assistant professor of business administration. Professor Luckman holds a PhD in organizational behavior from the Olin Business School at Washington University in St. Louis. And prior to her academic career, Professor Luckman cultivated her leadership perspectives during nearly a decade in luxury retailing, working in merchandising, selling, and management. Welcome, professors. At this time, I'm pleased to turn things over to Professor Larry DeBrock for an update on the economic impact of COVID-19. Professor DeBrock. Thanks, Amanda. I forgot to have to unmute myself to start. <laughs> no um, so uh, we have some slides, but I can't see them. Uh, there they are. Okay, so about six weeks ago, I, um, I gave the webinar uh, with, to talk about uh, this idea of the coronavirus and, the, and, the, and its economic impact. Now, when I gave that web webinar, it was just a couple days after um, all of the uh, economic uh, uh, closings had happened. The restaurants were, had been closed for about three days. The university here uh, had been closed for about three days. And uh, we were just beginning to get an indication of what the impact would be of the coronavirus. And, and so what, what I did last time, uh, next slide. Um, next one, <laughs> there. So I started by showing this slide that looks at the Standard and Poor 500 uh, for the United States stock market uh, for the year 2019. It's a very strong year. It grew 27.9% over the course of the year. It was a great investment to have money in the stock market in 2019. However, at the end of 2019, uh, uh, there was some indication that maybe the economy had uh, sort of ran its course and the recession was coming. After all, it had been the longest extended period of non-recession uh, in, uh, in many decades. 
And the uh, in 2000, in November and December, manufacturing orders were dropping. Uh, there was some softness in the automobile market, and there was this ongoing debate between uh, the Federal Reserve and the White House about whether they should be lowering interest rates to try to prevent a recession. Uh, if we take the next slide, you can see what happened uh, is that, it, uh, that that's the same standard in pours. This time, uh, Yahoo Finance shows it in red because uh, the numbers are going down. Um, and it, it, you can see that uh, for the first basically six weeks uh, of, the, of 2020, things were okay. And then uh, about the middle of February, uh, people started to get nervous about the, about the coronavirus and the market took a deep plunge. And in fact, you can see that all the way down to the valley there, that actually is a, a 28%. So they lost in a period of six weeks, we lost everything we had made in 12 months in 2019. And the question is, why did this, where did this come from? And at the time I gave the webinar six weeks ago, I said, well, you know, we, there was some softness in the economy at the, end of, uh, at the end of 2019. So that could have contributed to it. It's also the case that there was a giant oil glut because the Saudis and the Russians got into this warfare of putting tons of oil on the market. And it was really driving down the price of oil. And it turns out it used to be that the United States didn't care too much about that because we were importers of oil. But in November of 2019, for the first time in 70 years, the United States became a net exporter of oil. So when that oil price crashed, that hurt a lot of companies in the United States. There were a lot of oil companies. People, oil workers were getting laid off. Their profits were going down. So the question is, what, what's really happened? And go, go ahead to the next slide. The coronavirus clearly, however, is what's really happening here. This is a map uh, showing the coronavirus uh, across the planet. And as you can see, uh, the growth rate has been quite spectacular here in early 2019. And of course, that this picture was actually a week ago. It was updated on April 28th, which, which is a week ago. So I'm, I'm, sure, I'm sure it's worse. Uh, next slide. So what happened with the coronavirus? Well, what the coronavirus did, obviously it sent tons of people home from work. Uh, all restaurant employees uh, and uh, many factories were sent home. Anybody who wasn't considered, uh, uh, you know, a, an essential worker uh, was basically uh, furloughed or laid off or fired or whatever. these sorts of things happen. Take a look at this thing. This is a petroleum demand. And you can see it just fell off the edge of the table. That's because A, nobody was driving their car anymore. And B, airplanes were not flying. Now, airplanes are flying, but uh, TSA reported that in the United States, for the month of April, TSA screenings were down 95% from April 2019. So it's just a devastating effect on there. And that means people don't really want oil. And as a result, next slide. You see what happens to oil prices. Uh, oil prices have uh, been essentially cratering uh, because of this, uh, because of what's happening. So you still have this oil phenomena, but, it, but coronavirus is really causing a big problem. Uh, next slide. This is a startling picture. This is the uh, weekly initial unemployment uh, claims, uh, initial unemployment claims. And you can see, back, look back between 2008 and 2010, right there in 2009, that was what we called the Great Recession. And, and that's, that was the unemployment levels that we had for the Great Recession. Look what's happened here in just this month of April in, uh, in, in, in the United States. Those are up to uh, you know 25 million, 30 million. It's uh, it's just astounding. These are numbers like economists have never seen before. Um, next slide. And as you can see here, the U.S. economy has shrunk at its fastest rate in the decade, uh, with obviously worse to come. Uh, I shouldn't say obviously, but it, it it does seem that we're in a position. Obviously, this is what's going on right now. People, some states are beginning to back off a bit on the quarantines, trying to. Uh, give the economy a chance to grow, and we'll have to see how that plays out. I'm sure uh, people have different opinions of what's going after. We still can't call this a recession because uh, the only people who can actually name an official recession is an NBER, National Bureau of Economic Research, and they have not yet pronounced that we're in a recession. Uh, they need more data, they said. We need to have more extended period of time before we can call this. Most economists, I think, would say, well, it looks pretty bad. Next slide. Uh, in this case, you can see that the um, um, price of oil fell off the edge of the table. It actually went negative, okay? The price of oil went negative. Now, how can that happen, you say? Well, how can you, 
you they actually paid people $37 to take a barrel of oil off their hands. And the reason is because we had a complete supply chain disaster. We had tons of oil. We had more oil than anybody wanted and people were accepting, had to accept contracts because it was the end of the May contract in the futures market. So they actually had to take delivery. Well, if they take delivery, they have to have, to have a place to store it. There's no storage left in, in Oklahoma where, where, where the delivery is at Cushing, Oklahoma. And so uh, that was a supply chain problem. The next slide shows that this is happening all over the place. Uh, farmers, was, Dairy farmers, you have to milk your cow. If you got a dairy operation, you have to milk your cow in the morning and at night. So you're producing a lot of milk. Nobody wants it. You got piles and piles and piles of milk. They just have to dump it out. Once again, it would be like a negative price situation. There's just too much stuff there. Okay. And so they're just dumping it on the ground. They're smashing their eggs. They're plowing the vegetables under. There's a ton of food waste, even though there's a lot, because the supply chain has basically broken in, 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 in several markets. And as a result, You've got producers who have to continue to produce. The chickens are going to lay eggs. The cows are going to give milk. But uh, there's just nobody out there to get their hands on it. Next slide. The pol I'm going to close here by just pointing out the policy issues. Uh, the government really has two policy tools, monetary policy and fiscal policy. This slide says that the Fed, that's the monetary policy aim. The Fed has come down very hard. They're trying to do their best. They are providing tons of loans, tons of cash for loans. They've driven the interest rate almost down to zero. Next slide. Uh, and obviously this is the fiscal policy arm and Congress and the White House have reached uh, this deal for $2 trillion of stimulus bill. That was just the first of what, will tur what turned out to be many more. In fact, uh, it seems right now that there does, there's not a lot of taste for this going forward, uh, but uh, I think there's lots of balloons up in the air. Okay, that was my five minutes, but I actually took seven. No, no worries, Professor DeBrack. Thank you. I'll turn it over to Professor Torelli for an update on consumer behavior in the global marketplace. Good. Thanks, Amanda. And welcome everybody to this to this mock class. So next slide. Uh, what I'm going to talk here is uh, what I want to talk a few weeks back is what are some of the consequences for consumer behavior? And I, I started talking uh, back then to some direct consequences that were some obvious consequences. But what I, what I wanted to do today is to say what are some of the emerging trends from these direct consequences? You know, what Larry was saying, you know, we've seen some shortages of things in, in, in the supermarket aisle because people are stocking up or because of broken supply chains and, and, and logistics that have made some products difficult. To, to find like toilet paper, you know, at times there were eggs, you know, last week I couldn't find milk. And now I went this week to the supermarket and I found plenty of milk. So there's been this been disruption and, and companies are adjusting. But, but those are some of the direct things. I'm going to try to talk about what I see now. There are some emerging trends that are that, that, that we're going to be seeing from the direct consequences. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about what is the psychology behind responses to threats from infectious diseases. And, and I think this psychology is going to be with us for a while because uh, the best predictions are that this is probably going to stay with us or the risk from the coronavirus is going to stay there for about uh, a year or a year and a half if we're optimistic. Uh, then I'm going to pinpoint to some of the cultural differences in these responses and finally some some highlight some of the responses that businesses need to do uh, to address these concerns. Next slide. So Two of the emerging trends that come from these direct consequences is the consolidation of big streaming e-commerce brands and telecommunity and online learning becoming mainstream. You know, we talked uh, uh, a few weeks back when I conducted the webinar about, yep, it, it, now people are turning into online things. People were already doing things online, but what we're seeing is that there are some brands in the, on, in the online and the streaming e-commerce space that were strong before, that are being preferred now and that, and that markets are betting that they're going to continue and become even stronger uh, uh, for the time being. Netflix and, 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 uh, and Amazon are, are some of those two examples. And then telecommuting, I'm also going to talk about what are some of the trends in telecommuting and online learning. Let, next slide. So Netflix is emerging as one of the winners. And one of the things that's happening with Netflix is that, as you can imagine, nobody is shooting films right now. So there's going to be, at a point in time, a delay in some, for some of the streaming services to bring new content to market. 
uh, because you know they are relying on, on on filming to produce new things. But Netflix has such a humongous uh, a, a library of videos that if you are a Netflix user, then you really wouldn't notice that there is there might be some series that you wouldn't have the new version uh, available as soon as uh, as possible. But there's still plenty of uh, of of movies and TV sitcoms in 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 Netflix library for consumers not to notice that there is any any significant impact. And it's making Netflix one of the one of the big winners down the road. Amazon, you know, they just reported that they 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 didn't do as well in terms of profit. They did phenomenally well in terms of sales, and they are betting on trying to have safe operations. But if anything, Amazon, what has been is an uh, what has witnessed is an upswing in their business to levels that nobody could imagine. And we believe that these things are going to continue. These big brands are going to consolidate and become stronger. Next slide. Telecommuting and online learning. You know, we're in this online learning. You, we in Illinois have been pioneers in, in really making mass high quality online learning. You are attending this, this monk class and you're experiencing the quality of this online learning. And with this, many other students are doing that. And many colleges are realizing that we might be in a new normal in which online might not just be a niche element in our portfolio, but it could be mainstream. And perhaps what we move is into a direction in which even the fall semester or the spring semester might be thrown again to be online. Uh, but even if it's not, not the case, everybody's preparing to do it. So the, the worst case scenario or the best case scenario, if everything goes well, is that perhaps online is going to turn uh, higher education into hybrid learning. Same thing was for telecommuting. Many people were working from home before the pandemic, but now everybody's working from home. And then there are gonna be many people that are not gonna to return to the office, but continue working from home. Companies are realizing that renting space to have people that can work from home doesn't make too much sense, particularly in, in high, uh, metropol high cost metropolitan areas. So this idea of telecommuting, I think companies are gonna expand the, the, the opportunities for employees to work from home and to be that just the way that you operate normally. Next slide. Psychology of responses to threats, this is something that is a little bit more uh, subliminal, more implicit, more, more going unconsciously. You know, we're going to be living with this virus and, and, and that triggers in us a response, a defensive response. And one of the things that's been studied is that when there are threats from infectious diseases, people develop this or people uh, uh, activate what is called the behavioral immune system. And it's this idea that what can I do to detect infected people, even if I have to be really, really on the on the on the cautious side and qualify somebody as potentially infectious without this person really being infectious, because that's less risk for the individual. So this implies that anything that is non-normative, anything that looks a little weird. That, that doesn't conform to what we believe is the norm becomes suspicious. And if we think in terms of people that could be potentially infectious, people with, with uh, deformities, people that don't conform to standards of physical standards in a society, you know, we think about minority groups, for instance, they are non-standard by definition, then people become more suspicious of, of minority groups, of the elderly, of the obese, of people with deformities, with congenital diseases, that then could be potentially correlated with the disease itself. So I think this is going to be lingering there, and we see some evidence for, for uh, discriminatory uh, events throughout the country and throughout the world. Uh, conformist behaviors, conformist behaviors and attitudes. You know, when under threat, people want something that is familiar, something that it conforms to the norm. Social avoidance, that's the, that's the last thing. You know, we, we go now to the supermarket and we're with our shopping carts trying to avoid people. You know, that's gonna remain there. That notion of we wanna minimize social contact is gonna continue. Next slide. But, next slide. All right. So, but there are cultural differences uh, in how much people might rely on one or the other defense mechanism. This idea of, of an emphasis on the behavioral immune system uh, is being documented. That's probably more likely to occur in Western culture, there are, in which people have a stronger connection between the notion of a disease and a germ. 
uh, in some Eastern cultures, that notion that diseases are carried primarily by germs are not as are not as as, as culturally uh, salient. Then, then I think this this behavioral immune system and aversion toward people who are non-standard is going to be stronger in Western cultures in the U.S. and and Europe. Uh, whereas that notion of being of conforming to behaviors and attitudes and focus on safety uh, should be more common in East Asian and Latin American cultures that are more collectivistic because of their collectivistic natures. They, by definition, conform to norms and value safety. So then these are gonna be things that are gonna be just reinforced. Next slide. So in summary, these are gonna lead companies to deal with this doing different things. One of the things that we think is gonna be useful is for companies to make their brands feel familiar using classic designs and products, emphasizing local production and sourcing. You know, as an anecdote, I went shopping this week and my, my kids wanted uh, Oreo cookies and I couldn't find the regular Oreo cookies. You know, they were out of stock, but you could find the peanut butter field Oreo cookies, the birthday party Oreo cookies, the dark chocolate Oreo cookies, any of the other versions of Oreo cookies, but the just plain traditional Oreo cookie, it's not there. So that, that, that is an anecdote, but that fits with what I think is gonna happen. People are gonna be looking for things that are more familiar, more standard, more normative, that provide more safety. Emphasize leadership position because leadership also speaks to conformity. Then even if you can emphasize your leadership in a narrow, you know, by saying, you know, I'm the leader of this small market, that's gonna be useful. Position as the status quo whenever possible. This idea again of leadership, familiarity is going to be important. Next slide. Safety. I, I couldn't emphasize this more. Uh, safety is going to be critical. We're seeing that some retailers are opening, Macy's stores are opening, but you cannot try the clothing. Who would try clothing that you don't know if it's been touched by somebody to, who had coronavirus? Then that notion of focus on safety is gonna be critical, but safety it would, would go beyond physical safety. It could also be financial safety. People are gonna be looking more for warranties. Social safety, again, as I said, conformity to norms. And physical safety, as I say, is emphasizing you know, cleanliness for the uh, businesses that in which cleanliness is an important aspect is gonna be central. So this is pretty much what I had, and you know, I look forward to uh, your questions uh, later in the session. Thank you. Thank you, Carlos. I want to turn it over to Professor Luckman to discuss the ethical issues facing global commerce during this time. Thank you so much, and thank you all for being here. It's a pleasure to be here today. I think it's safe to say that even throughout the last two presentations, you heard a lot of uh, ethical implications and issues um, that are uh, cropping up during this time. Uh, next slide, please, Kyle. Uh, but I want to focus on one in particular. And, and the key sort of overriding ethical issue here is this balance between public health, taking care of the livelihood and the lives of the people who are affected by the, the virus, and the financial health, our economy, our ability to work. And so the question is, is, is this an either or? Is that, Or is there a middle path? Is there another way to think about this? So what I'm going to do is sort of back up and give you some different perspectives that we can draw on to think about this. Um, and then we'll, we'll come to some very brief and high level conclusions in our five minutes. So first of all, let's start with the idea that we identify locally, right? We, we get up in the morning and we are, we are concerned with feeding our family, housing ourselves, the people we come in contact with, our immediate communities. But despite the fact that that's our daily experience, we are massively globally interdependent, right? Most of the goods that you have in front of you, I'm sitting here with a cell phone in front of me, um, computers, electronics, even the, the ventilators are, are made by different, um, uh, different manufacturers throughout the world. So we are largely interdependent on areas throughout the world, which means we have to step back and think globally as well as locally. Next slide, please. And so what, what I'm going to offer you here are some perspectives to think about this dilemma from an ethical point of view. Uh, next slide. Thank you. Uh, Kyle, you beat me to it. Um, so here are three ethical perspectives that we can use to think about this dilemma. The first is the UN Universal Declaration of Human Rights. This was penned in 1948 and, and talks about um, the basic rights of, of life, survival, liberty, and so forth. In 2015, uh, the UN penned the Ruggie Principles or the Guiding Principles on Business 
rights. And these are guiding principles on how businesses are supposed to behave. And it, it includes the role of businesses to respect, protect, and remedy the violations of human rights and fundamental freedoms. So here we have um, a, a UN declaration that says that businesses have a right to contribute to, the, to human rights. Next piece is fairness. So when we think about ethical dilemmas, we often think about how are we fair or equal to as many people as possible. But at the end of the day, we can't treat everyone equally. We have to look at the context. Um, where we see this is consider the triage unit in a medical facility. Um, the person who is the most sick is going to get the most attention. And that is, that is for, good, for a good purpose because overall that will serve the greater group. And finally, many of you are probably familiar with the concept of utilitarianism, which is essentially a cost benefit perspective. And the this is also exemplified in the triage example. And that is, um, how can we balance this cost and benefit to maximize benefit or happiness? So what do all of these perspectives tell us? Next slide, please, Kyle. The first is, all of these perspectives suggest that there is a moral imperative to protect human life. I think that we can all agree on that, that we have to reduce the pandemic infections. We have to get people healthier. The second moral imperative that these all contribute to, to is that um, we have to encourage global commerce. So why would we think about global commerce as a moral imperative using these principles? Next slide, please. The first is that, um, and you heard a lot of these issues both from Professor DeBrock and Professor Torelli in their pr presentation. So the first is without work, the underemployed suffer terribly, both from a financial perspective, but also there are psychological and mental well being effects that are much bigger and um, much, much less easy to sort of quantify, um, but certainly have a massive impact on the economy and on the world. The second is that um, you know, our consumer habits are going to change. So we saw the big problems this week with the meat industry where big meat plants are having to shut down. And now all of a sudden, um, there isn't a, as much meat available. And so you have organizations that have stepped up and said, well, if we've got to do something different, so let's create like the Impossible Burger um, organization. So they're, they're jumping in and taking advantage of these opportunities because fundamentally, if we don't pay attention to the global economy, then we will suffer in ways that we probably aren't really prepared to based on our current standards of living. And most importantly, the, we need commerce, we need business because it's what helps provide the basic necessities for dealing with that first moral imperative. Um, that's what creates ventilators and respirators and PPE and all of the things that we need to reduce the infection. So this suggests that there has to be sort of a middle way. And, and one example of this, Paul Romer uh, wrote about this, um, was suggesting that there is this is some practical implications of what this might look like and that is take a lot of money right now and invest in testing and testing kits and protective gear so let's figure out who the populations are who are sick and who are at risk and let's protect them so again not equal treatment but equal treatment in context let's protect them and then let's give other people the opportunity to get back into work and start to rebuild the economy uh, next slide please so the argument here is that we really need to flip the mental model. It's not about an either or. It's not about which sacrifices do we have to make on both sides, but rather how do we maximize the overlap of where these benefits sort of come together? So how do we find that middle path? How do we find that golden mean? Next slide, please. So we, we're, our argument here is that you don't have to sacrifice lives and you don't have to succumb to financial disaster, but it requires that flipping that mental model to rethink about how we are going to approach bringing the economy back up online, which by the way, is not going to look, it, it does not necessarily mean that the business as, as usual is all, all of a sudden going to happen rather, right? So we're going to see um, a, a very different way of doing business. And so that's really important. Um, and we have to work together and think about how these opportunities intersect. Next slide, please. And, you know, we live in this complex world. And I think it's really important to note that, first of all, when, when people make decisions in the face of fear and uncertainty, which is where we are right now, um, we tend to react very intuitively without doing our full due diligence. And we tend to react very rashly, meaning we throw big solutions out there. And for 
situations of uncertainty, if you take a complex adaptive systems perspective, what we really need to do is start small and start making those changes so that we can see how they affect the broader system to see if they're maximizing the benefit for as many people as possible. One of the questions that's come up, so this is sort of my wrap up to, to the segment, um, is will this change, will this pandemic and what we're experiencing change how we think about and how we engage in capitalism? Um, back in September, the Business Roundtable released a statement that they were no longer, the, you know, the philosophy had changed from focusing solely on shareholders to focusing on st all stakeholders and how to, again, maximize the benefits for as many people as possible. Um, so I think a question for this middle path, longer term, is how can all organizations work together to, for the overall good of individual society uh, and society? Um, and this is part of that looking to maximize the benefit um, and find that middle path where it exists. So thank you so much. And I'm going to turn it back over to Amanda for our Q&A. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank, thank you, Carlos and Larry as well. Uh, really appreciate those updates and, and uh, thoughtful remarks on each of these three topics. We've got some great questions coming into the chat, which is where we will start, but also want to invite all of you out there who might like to bring your question live into the digital classroom to raise your hand. And behind the scenes, my colleague Erica will um, check in with you and and get you ready to do that if, uh, if appropriate. So uh, for starters, jumping back to, uh, to Larry. Larry, question for you around the, the fiscal relief and uh, monetary policy measures taken by the United States and other governments. Um, wondering if you think uh, increased spending will take the public debt out of control, and in your view, are some states restarting economic activity prematurely? You Larry, it looks like you muted. Yeah. Figure this out. Second question uh, is probably not up to me. Uh, I, you know, I, 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 I'm a big fan of letting public health people and and and, and doctors figure out what uh, you know when when we can when we can when we can solve that type of problem. But we do certainly back to the first question. Economists are not too worried about the size of the federal debt. Okay, as long as the federal debt, um, you know, it, it's going to we're going to have to spend some money to get out to, to get out of what's happening as. As Elizabeth, Elizabeth just talked about, you know, we need more tests. We need to spend a lot of money on testing right now in order to figure out where we are with this virus. Um, and the economics, you know, it looks like we're losing a, in terms of lo lost economic activity in a single day is, you know, somewhere on the order of $16 billion because of everybody staying home and restaurants are closed and all that. Now, if you think $16 billion is a lot, just multiply it by let's say 30 days in a month, you're talking about $500 billion uh, it, it, over the course of a month. Uh, you know, if you could do something like say Congress could take uh, a very large stimulus bill that might, for example, be able to get us out of this, uh, get us back working uh, a month faster than it would have if we didn't do it, uh, you could spend a lot of money and still be it would still be a good return on your dollars. So I don't I'm not worried about that right now. All right, Th thanks, Larry. So uh, we have our first live question from from Yasha. Uh, Erica is going to bring the the learner in, and we'll bring that question to the classroom. Hello. Uh, so I'm from Massachusetts, and Governor Charlie Baker stated in a recent conference that certain businesses deemed not fully essential can now return to operations. How would not fully essential businesses, for example, nail salons or more generally barber shops, operate with the CDC guidelines of six feet? And more importantly, when those businesses do open, the general manager and those in management positions do not receive unemployment because the business is open, but the people working the other jobs are receiving more money and unemployment in pay than they make uh, as their salary. So until June, we're uh, where the unemployment system is going to be rethought. Are the managers just expected to do the jobs of everybody else? And the following statement was actually said by somebody in response to the news that the establishment they work in is being reopened. I'm making more on unemployment than I would have been making without any sales. 
Thanks. Thanks, Yasha. Um, Larry or uh, Larry, Carlos, Elizabeth, any reactions or responses to those comments and questions? Well, I don't know much about the social rules in, um, in uh, Massachusetts. I think that what I've been following in the newspaper is that these uh, stores that are, be like you said, nail salons that are being opened are have sort of st supposedly strict uh, social distancing rules. You know, there's only one person. You can't just come in and sit beside somebody. You have to wait your turn either six feet away or out on the street. Uh, and but I'm what about the people actually operating the staff of the workplace? And then this could probably be applied to everybody, to every other state, not just Massachusetts. I'm sure, sure other businesses that are not essential are also going to open in other states besides where I am. Correct. But what I, I guess I don't. I guess I'm not sure what your question is. You, you were you were well, you sound to me like you were stating some facts, and I wondered what your question is. So the question is, how would businesses where contact between the staff and the customer is there? How would they operate because of the safety guidelines? I don't know. Yeah, I mean, the store is different. They have plastic plastic shields at the grocery store. They. Um, uh, uh, people have have, adapt, have adapted in different ways. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I can't figure it out either. This, uh, my uh, hair is uh, substantially longer than it's ever been since probably the 1970s, but there's no barbers here in town to, uh, to, to help me out of this problem. Oh, I, think, uh, I think that's a great question. And I was looking in the chat and I saw a couple of people as, the, as it was running by kind of fast, ask the same questions about schools. So how do you socially distance when, especially in an elementary school, you know, a fundamental sort of interaction component of games and play is a part of it. Um, right. So uh, I don't have a specific how to answer to that, but I, I think what you're bringing up is really important. And that is we are in a moment of so much uncertainty right. that everything we, we have to just try we have to try things and so maybe everybody goes in and wears full protective equipment or um or maybe they change the way they do the business maybe they put up i don't know I, i'm specifically again i don't have a how-to but i think you're bringing up a really good question that's applied everywhere so thanks yeah. for asking that yeah, yeah. I, I would only add that uh, there's gonna it, these are two sides of the coin. One is how the business operate, and is there a market for that? Is there a demand? You know, one of the things is that there's gonna be a self-selection process in which some businesses are, the demand is gonna rise so much that's gonna be questionable uh, in the short term or even in the long term whether there's gonna be any business left. You know, I just saw today that Norwegian Cruise Line is thinking that they're gonna go out of business. You know, if you're a cruise ship line, how do you operate in this environment? You know, you know there's not gonna be any ships departing in the next month, two, three, four, but it could be what, six, eight. As I said, the psychology of the infection uh, is gonna is gonna linger in people's heads and some businesses are gonna struggle to really be viable. But what, what Larry uh, and Elizabeth are saying is that also businesses are very innovative. Um, there are things that businesses are doing, were doing before the pandemic that we never imagined could happen. Who would think about something like Uber or something like 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 Grubhub and, and those kind of things. Those were unthinkable, but people thought about them and, and you're starting to see some innovation in how people do things. So, and that, that, that there is also an opportunity for new businesses like selling you stuff till you cut your hair yourself at home. And that might replace uh, the barber. Uh, and yeah, we know there are videos and there you can buy your stuff, but somebody can figure out something. I have no idea, but uh, this, is, this is also an opportunity for innovation, I think. Yeah, I agree. Thank you. Um, we have some more questions uh, possibly coming in live, but uh, Thomas, going to ask you quickly if you could make Erica co-host. She had to uh, drop off and come back in due to an issue with Zoom. No problem. Um, and thank you. In the meantime, we'll switch back over to some questions in the, the chat. So this global audience here today, people from all across the world joining us and Two specific markets came up in the chat. One is Latin America, specifically Mexico and Venezuela and the impacts um, in those countries as well as, um, as well as the South Asian markets and the impacts there. So curious from the perspective of you know, consumer behavior and, and, um, and ethics, the impacts that we might be seeing in those countries that are different from uh, what's seen elsewhere, what people can be prepared for. 
Well, it's, uh, I can start talking a little bit about consumer behavior. You know, it's a very broad question, so I don't know if there's anything specific about that, but uh, one of the things that uh, we know uh, um, based on research is that this country is by definition, the focus on safety and, uh, uh, and norms and normative behavior are, are naturally important. And those are gonna become even, even more salient. Uh, so, but this country, is, as far as I've heard, uh, you know, they haven't been hit at the same level. And it's a little bit puzzling. We don't know if it's that there is not enough testing, there is not enough reporting, reporting. I can speak a little bit for Venezuela. I'm from Venezuela. We have no idea what's going on in Venezuela. Nobody knows. You know, there is no news. There is no independent confirmation of anything. But Mexico, which is a little bit more open, uh, still doesn't seem to be impacted at the same level. And one wonder whether what's going on, you know, that there are some theories about the temperature, about etc. I mean, I'm not a health expert, but what we see is there being a rally around the president in Mexico. And at the beginning, the president said, you know, we'll go business as usual. And then the president said, you know, you're not got to be more careful. Again, this shows this idea of we're looking for the norm. We're looking for things that look familiar, things that we trust. Uh, so familiar brands are, are, are going to have a, a leg up in, 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 in Latin America, I think even more than they would in the United States. Thank you. Thank you, Carlos. Uh, so another question coming in live from Sanshita. Uh, so hello, I'm from India. And uh, my question was that uh, we talked a little while ago about fiscal expansion. So would you say that the fiscal expansion should be uh, skewed towards bigger corporations or the smaller ones? Like uh, when you talk about I don't think, uh, you know, I, 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 you know, I just think the fiscal expansion that that I would like to see happen is, uh, at least in the United States, is just spending a lot of money on infrastructure, putting people back to work, spending money on tests. I'm telling you, tests are, as far as I'm concerned, tests are the most important thing we should be thinking about because it gets to this whole issue of what Elizabeth was trying to talk about. You know, do we do we go for the saving lives or do we go for trying to get the economy back together uh, or do we do the the roamer thing of trying to go down the middle well you still have to have tests and right now you know in, I, I looked at the numbers this morning and it said that california has done 780,000 tests 780,000 tests is a lot of tests but they have 40 million people that means it's less than two percent of the population they're testing that's just not right we just have to have more mm -hmm. tests out there and that's spending that as I tried to hint the time before, in my answer before, I think that's spending that actually will pay dividends because the more we do this, so spending a lot of money, I agree with that, uh, fiscal stimulus, but it's gonna, uh, it's gonna put people to work uh, making these tests and it's going to get to the fundamental problem is we have to, we have to beat this virus before we can expect the economy to come back. And so you also mentioned that in the Western countries, it's more likely likely that a behavioral immune system mentality is formed. So do you think that will have an impact on the labor markets? It could definitely. I think it will, and and we're seeing uh, uh, you know some evidence that. Uh, you know, discrimination against, particularly against uh, Asians, Asian Americans, is on the rise, regardless of whether you are Chinese or from any other uh, Asian. Uh, and that's going to translate to business. It's going to translate to hiring. It's going to translate, you know, these implicit biases have been with us forever. And whenever they are heightened, there's going to be definitely some, 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 some effects. So, uh, uh, you know, there are laws against that, but uh, uh, still, I think it's going to be a more difficult environment than it was before, and politics might also fuel this if if there is more of a taking an anti-immigrant stand, which is what what we see is probably going to happen in the in the political campaign. Okay, thank you so. Thank you. Thanks for the questions, Anshita. Um, all right, one more question here in the chat. So uh, this is a question that many have uh, have indicated an interest in. Um, what do you think will happen to the long-term sustainability targets of companies as this short-term uh, pandemic pandemic focus takes over? Uh, could you read that question again? Yeah. 
what do you think will happen to the long-term sustainability targets of organizations as short-term focuses take over? I can, I can start on that one. Um, my, first of all, I think it's a great question because uh, you know, I mentioned briefly that in, in times of fear and uncertainty, we default to our gut and intuition and we don't really think about them. And that also means we, we default to the short term. And so these sort of quick fixes without thinking about the long term implications become the, the default um, decision making. So what will happen? I think it's very likely that people will stop thinking about the long term and just make whatever rash de decision needs to happen right now to solve to save today. Um, but I think it is important to challenge ourselves to step back and ask, you know, and, and part of the problem here is we always have, we usually have some semblance of certainty. We have some idea that we have, we can predict at least what the future might look like if we do X, how Y might turn out. But right now it feels like that's all gone and we have no ability to predict what different futures might exist. Um, you know, decision-making research has shown over and over again that one of the best ways we can make consistently make good decisions is sort of future cast all of the alternatives that might come up. So I would encourage people to, to think about that when they find themselves having this sort of gut reaction response is really step back and say, okay, let's look at all the potential long-term implications. We don't know which one is the most likely to happen at this point, but at least if we get them all on the table, we can, we can challenge ourselves to be thinking with a long-term mindset. Yeah, th thanks, Elizabeth. I think that's great takeaway advice, right? Um, for all of us in our, our day-to-day -day and in our business decisions from um, leadership positions um, and all across the organization. So great insights. All right, we have a live question coming in from Richard. Hello, yeah. Hi, my name is Richard, I'm from India. So basically I had two questions. So the first one was uh, talking about the psychology. So uh, now because of all this, the, now the social distancing is something we have to follow and we have to, you know, make it as a routine thing in a normal day-to-day -day life. And now when you uh, look up, like this is okay when we uh, see Japan as a country as a whole, wherein they are actually practicing that and the practice of wearing mask and, you know, going around, that is actually normal. But when we talk about countries like India and US sort of, so there, uh, like, this is actually going to change in a big way. So is that a practical solution to this? So that is the first question. And uh, the second question is talking about the local manufacturing. So uh, now we are actually focusing on local manufacturing at a great scale. So if, if we are actually doing local manufacturing, the relation between the countries is going to affect in a big way. So 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 how to go about this now in this case okay so uh, the psychology you know there's some the psychology applies to pretty much everybody i said there might be some emphasis in some culture and others the, the, but there are practices that are traditions in some cultures this idea of wearing masks in asia japan china Hong Kong, Singapore. It's been there for many, many years. And, and you know, for foreigners who travel to these countries and they see this, they think, well, these guys are crazy. You know, they are, are they paranoid that they think that, that I'm going to get infected by when they go out? And actually, it's the opposite. They always done it to protect others. You know, it's that collectivistic notion. And not all collectivistic countries that have concern with not only uh, the others, but also my responsibility in protecting others. So, and that's something that's being well established in, in, in some of East Asian countries uh, that it's normal for them to do it. But definitely it's been shown that it's useful uh, because one of the things that we know with this pandemic that now we know now is that you can be contagious when you have absolutely no symptoms. And then if you have no symptoms, then you would assume that you already are infected. And then if you wear a mask, then you are less likely to uh, infect somebody else. Uh, but we're seeing it here in the United States that culturally speaking, for, for whatever reasons, I'm not going to get into the details of that, is actually a divide based on political ideology. And what you find is that among Republicans, then wearing masks is becoming a big no-no because it feels like it's a sign of weakness and a culture that is emphasizes, you know, independence, liberty, and I do what I want and what I desire, and, and I'm a strong and I'm in, an invincible, you know, I'm a superhero, then why do I need to wear a mask? As if the mask is to protect me. It's really not to protect you, it's to protect others. But that notion of, well, why would you wear a mask to protect others? 
you know, others should protect themselves. So it's going to be really, really hard for this practice of wearing masks to work in the United States. And we're seeing some examples of people getting, getting killed because uh, in, in, in shopping stores, uh, they are asking uh, customers to wear masks. And there was an event, I don't remember in which state, and we somebody then pull a gun and kill the guy. Uh, uh, so because, again, it's a little bit political because the notion of you want me to wear a mask is you want me to show my weakness and my political affiliation. So I don't think that's going to work in the United States. Unfortunately, uh, uh, it's my personal opinion. Uh, that's going to be a problem to control the, the spread of the virus here is that's going to be very, very difficult. And we're going to see this is going to happen in some parts of the country more easily than others. Uh, the second about local things, uh, when I was emphasizing the, uh, this notion of emphasizing localness, is because localness breeds familiarity, and, and that helps to then create some notion of safety. Uh, but as Elizabeth was saying, uh, the world is globalized. That's not going to go away. You know, that, this idea that yeah, now we know that we should make our own mask and our own ventilators uh, so yeah. that the next time the pandemic hits, I don't need to rely on China. Good luck with that. that that's a good stuff that's going to happen for few months to gain some some support but at the end of the day these global supply chains are well established not only because you want it but because availability of raw materials you know economies of scale yeah yeah you might make your own mask and each mask would cost 10 bucks well good luck that's not going to be scalable up so there's going to be things that attempts to bring locality to what's feasible and there are going to be things that definitely are more feasible but that doesn't mean that now the world is going to become that we're all going to be in our own little corner making our own little things uh, uh, companies cannot survive like that and still as long as we have private entities stock markets and uh, they're going to be pushing for efficiency and efficiency is in, in globalization yeah, I, I, get, I can't agree more, Carlson. This idea of, uh, you know, the supply chain broke down. And uh, so people say, well, maybe what we have to do is just do manufacture locally so we don't have to be dependent on it. The reason that we are doing global transactions because it's much more efficient. It's much more efficient to have, uh, you know, part, parts, some of the parts of the coats are made in this country. Some of the other parts of the coats are made in another country. It's, you know, not just masks. Uh, think about the fact that uh, one example I had, the milk supply chain is completely local here in the United States. Okay. And yet we can't make it work. People are dumping milk down uh, uh, in the ground and Carlos couldn't get milk at the grocery store a week ago uh, because the farmers are just getting rid of their milk. That's not a global supply chain problem. It's the United States all internalized. So just doing local manufacturing doesn't mean that you're, uh, you're going to get around these problems. Thank you, sir. Thanks for the question, Richard. Thank you, Carlos and Larry, for your, your insights and, and reactions. Larry, a question for you. Uh, with the current US push to open the economy, could you comment on the role consumer confidence will play? And maybe, maybe Carlos here a little bit too. Even if businesses opened this minute, how likely are consumers to start spending? Yeah, I don't think very likely. I mean, I, I mean even if they, if the, if the governor said all restaurants are going to be open, I don't expect uh, a restaurant owner to imagine that they're going to have uh, a, a long line of reservations trying to get in there. People, I think, are both, you know, Carlos and, and, and Elizabeth talked about these things, but people are changing the way they view uh, how they should behave in this. And I don't know if it's going to be just a short run phenomenon for people to come back or if it'll, if it'll happen down the road. But I, uh, yeah, I, I just think because just because Macy says the door is open, I'm not going there. Yeah. Yep, I, I agree. It's I think it's it's that consumer behavior, that psychology of again being vigilant, being careful, thinking about safety, cleanliness. Uh, it's going to linger as long as we see 2,000, 3,000, 1,500 deaths per day. You know, you have it constantly blinking there. Uh, and it's true. It's not just like the media does it just to scare you. Uh, it would be responsible to make decisions without knowing what's going on out there. So there's going to be industries and markets that's going to take a while. We have no idea how long. Thanks. Um, 
just a quick note here that uh, we've got lots of great questions coming in. Really appreciate our faculty responding to some that we've been able to pose. But if you have questions to post in the chat, we will collect those and send some responses via email. So take a minute now if you have questions to post them there in the chat so we can get those from you. I'm going to pose one last question to Professor Luckman and then I want to give um, each of our faculty members a, a minute or two to make any closing remarks um, generally related to questions or, or things that they wanted to bring in they haven't yet had a chance to. But uh, Elizabeth, from an ethics perspective, uh, this issue of privacy concerns uh, behind like tracing, tracing um, contact from mobile phones and then this widespread uh, protests against lockdown orders, um, how can we how can we balance that and, and what do you think is what do you think the future looks like there? I'll start with a really unsatisfactory answer, which is, well, we don't know yet, do we? Um, so this issue around privacy in particular is, is really interesting because it's not, I wouldn't say it's a new phenomenon, but it certainly has been enhanced in recent years because of, of what technology is capable of. Um, you know, I think there's always everything when we think about ethics and morality, like, let me just sum it up for you. It's all about the self versus other and finding a really good balance, right? There it is. You, there's ethics for you. Um, so what is our personal responsibility to, to contribute to society? And what is the, the society's contribution to us? So I, I think that policy decisions are going to be made at a pretty high level around a lot of these privacy issues about what, what companies are allowed to collect and use and what they're not. But I also think we can be thoughtful about that from an individual perspective based on what, what apps we use or what devices we use. To some extent, we can exercise some of our, of our preferences in that way. Um, I, I think where, what this really is, is a really good question that we could, should continue to talk about and share information on, um, because then we have the, you know, the personal responsibility component and then the organizational responsibility. What are they doing with that data and how are they protecting it? Um, there is value to having that data, um, certainly for society and for individuals, but it also can be misused and it's trying to find that balance. Thank you, Elizabeth. So I'll invite um, each of the faculty to just make any closing remarks. I'll, I'll frame a question in case you want to uh, share your closing remarks in relationship to that. But thinking about, um, you know, what are the, are there any positive outcomes um, or opportunities resulting from this time in the areas that you each are experts in? And, and what does that look like? Um, feel free to use that to uh, shape your closing remarks or uh, share some other perspectives if you prefer. I'll go. Um, I think uh, I, I've said this several times in here, but I, I got, since you're going to give me a chance one more time, I think uh, the government has to, uh, has to act more strongly. We need federal help in this case, uh, especially for tests. We are remarkably behind in the testing in this country and uh, and it shows it works when bad countries that have uh, very aggressive testing policies uh, have have more than flattened the curve and are getting control of this problem. Uh, we're not there because we just don't spend enough money on tests right now, and it's a big problem. We have a very uh, I, I, we have a very heterogeneous healthcare system. We have different buyers. Medicaid pays one rate, Medicare pays another rate, private insurers pay another rate. All of these different rates for, uh, that they're pay to get their hands on tests doesn't really lead to um, sort of an efficient outcome, as an economist would say. Uh, but if the government would just decide to throw, you know, large amounts of money uh, at this testing problem, it would a be stimulus to the economy, and b I think it will help move us along the path that Elizabeth was talking about with Romer and, and, and in that in that in that zone. Thanks, thanks, Larry. Uh, well, I, I think, uh, you know, some, there's already, there are already some winners in this. You know, there are some companies that are thriving out of the coronavirus, you know, Zoom is Zoom. one, you know, we're using Zoom and the Zoomification of the world has made Zoom, uh, you know, a company that nobody thought could be valued what it's going to be. Uh, and, you know, Amazon, I talked about that. It's, it's just also, you know, they're dealing with some front cost. So they're already winners. And in, in every crisis, they're going to be winners. They're going to be losers. And they, they might be losers that are, we're going to remember. Well, these were the companies or the industries that went down after the coronavirus. 
uh, as there being other events, wars and other type of events that have brought some businesses down because they were not needed anymore. Uh, so there, those are the, 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 there's a lot of opportunity for innovation and, and arbitrage and finding uh, open niches that haven't been developed. And in terms of consumer behavior, uh, the changes, if these changes stick, will depend really on how long the, the pandemic is going to last. And we don't know. You know, there might be a vaccine. Some people talking at the end of the summer, some people talking in December, some people talking in two years. Depending on for how long this lasts, then the long-term consequences of cultural changes that this might bring are going to be more long-lasting. Well, to add on to both Carlos and Larry's point, I think uh, we are in a, mo a moment of really deep uh, transformation, right? And so there are opportunities for innovation um, in a moment of transformation, but transformation is also really uncomfortable and really hard. Um, so I think we, we all just can acknowledge that and that really helps us. Um, I, I wanna say, I think one of the big takeaways for me, the more conversations I have about th this, this topic is we, we just have to be really thoughtful about what we think we know because we don't have a full, we haven't tested the full population. Um, so, and we, we have some research around, you know, whether or not masks and social distancing work and we have some preliminary results and those are good and we should listen to those, but we should learn from each of those and each of our experiences and continue to develop um, before we make sweeping claims. And, and that is, I think, a really important part of what's going on right now. And to end, you know, you asked the question about the positive that could come out of this. There, there's always a question from somebody in every audience that, well, how can you, what's ethics in business? There's no ethics in business. But I actually think what this pandemic is highlighting and making very salient is that business is all about people. People are all about ethics and therefore business is about ethics and ethics is about business. So if we can be thoughtful about the ethical dilemmas that we're facing, I think we can learn from that while going through this transformation. Thank you. Um... Great closing remarks. Really appreciate uh, all of the great insights from Professors Luckman, DeBrack, and Torelli today. Also, thanks to all of you who have attended us, attended with us today. We hope you enjoyed this mock live class and that you've gained some takeaways that will help you respond to the challenges and opportunities during this unique time and in the future. Uh, we look forward to being in touch with each of you soon and wish you all the best in the meantime. Thanks again. Thank you. Hi, guys.